So let's begin. This is the March meeting of Safe Silver Spring, a community-based non nonprofit which hopes to bring uh, uh, the police and the community together, as well as to discuss issues of public safety. Um, we've got about 20 people on the call right now. I'd like to introduce uh, the board members who are on the call. We've got Julio Murillo. Uh, we have Yudi Rodriguez. We have uh, Daniel Caroma and Amy Henchy and um, Justin Chapel, um, who have uh, volunteered to be on the Safe Silver Spring Board. We hope to uh, meet uh, this way um, four times a year, have a quarterly meeting with uh, the third district commander, um, Commander uh, Darren Frank, who is going to be our featured speaker this evening. I think since we'll just just start since we have a small group right now, just by asking people to introduce themselves and just say where they live. So we get a sense of uh, what kind of issues uh, people might want to talk about. So Julio, why don't you start introducing yourself and tell people where you live? Yeah, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I don't live in the county, but I, I do work for council member Hucker, uh, you know, which includes Silver Spring. So I'm uh, uh, very interested in knowing um, what's going on in Silver Spring, especially in public safety. So uh, I thank Commander Frank for being here tonight. Thank you. I just got a note that uh, Jacob Newman, who is a member of our board, is also on the call. He's got some kid issues, so he is going to be muted. Um, Barbara? Yes? Um, who are you and where do you live? Well, I live in Leisure World, and I'm one of a large group of politically active people here, including Rosie, who I thought I might see here on the screen, uh, Engman. Mm -hmm. And um, I've lived here about eight years, and uh, I like it. And I hope the police are doing the right thing. It's very important to me. I worked with abused children in Florida for years, and I, you know, I know a lot of the issues. Judy. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Judy Rodriguez. I live in Silver Spring, and I am the co-chair of this uh, group. And I'm just looking to really stay connected with the community. And as a young professional, Latina, female, um, I, I think it's important that we are having these discussions and conversations connecting the police department with the community. Thank you so much. Uh, Lynn. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, hello, good evening. I'm Lynn Bales. I live in Silver Spring. I'm in 3D, uh, part of Seven Oaks. And uh, nice to see everybody tonight. Thank you for joining us. Mark? Mark Pastor. Um, I live in downtown Silver Spring and been here a long time. Chris? In uh, the central section of, of Silver Spring, and I'm in the fourth police district. Uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Amy. Amy Henshi, I live in the North Woodside area of Silver Spring, off of uh, 16th Street and Second Avenue. I am the treasurer <laughs> of this organization. Um, I, I think probably because of my. Um, many years of service um, with the Internal Revenue Service. I, I do have some um, uh, tax and bookkeeping type of uh, knowledge that I can bring to the organization. It's good to be here. I'm also the widow of Woody Brosnan, who was the co-founder of Safe Silver Spring, along with Tony Hausner. That's why uh, Amy is our treasurer, Matt. Where do you live? Hi, uh, I'm Matt Kaiser. I live in uh, Tacoma Park. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Uh, Tom Dagonia, and I'm a lawyer here in Montgomery County. I live up in the Olney area. Okay. Uh, Mel Tull. Uh, <clears throat> I live way up uh, 270 in Montgomery Village. But as you know, my interest in Silver Spring goes back probably uh, 40 or 50 years as I followed different things happening. So it's, uh, I, I just qualify as an old guy. <laughs> uh, Chris? 
Ms. Farrell. Okay, we'll skip to uh, MJ. Oh, hi, I live um, near Four Corners and I just saw the, the topic, it looked interesting um, as far as what's going on in Silver Spring. We hope it's interesting, Marilyn Pierre. Oh, Marilyn's here. Hi everyone, I Marilyn Pierre, thank you very much, Alan and everyone else. I live in the uh, western part of the county, and I lived in, in uh, Montgomery County Police Department District 1D. Well, thank you for being here, Justin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Justin Chapel. I live in uh, South Silver Spring uh, on the border with Washington, D.C. And Justin is the president of the South Silver Spring Neighborhood Association. Thank you, Justin. Um, Daniel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Daniel Karoma, long term resident of White Oak, uh, right off um, Milestone Drive, where the, uh, you know, the district offices, the police offices. Thank you for joining us. Dory, we have Dory too, Mark. Dory, are you there? We do have Dory too. Um, Lucky. <laughs> I'm Dory Pastor. Um, I live with Mark in <laughs> downtown Silver Spring, East Silver Spring area. Thank you for doing this. Sure. And we've got Jacob who is uh, with us and uh, Alan Bowser. I live in downtown Silver Spring near the intersection of Wayne Avenue and Dale Drive. And I'm one of the co-chairs of uh, of Safe Silver Spring, this organization has been around for about uh, for about 15 years. Um, I believe it popped out of the uh, neighborhoods committee of the uh, um, Silver Spring Citizens Advisory Group Neighborhoods Committee, and uh, we've been uh, working on a constructive dialogue between uh, residents and the police uh, since uh, since then. So welcome everybody. So what we'd like to do with this. Um, and the major thing that we do with uh, Safe Silver Spring is we have conversations with the police uh, periodically, giving them a chance to tell us what's going on in the district and an opportunity for residents to ask questions to the police. And uh, it's been a very useful uh, back and forth over the years. So hopefully tonight will be no exception. So without further ado, let's get right into our program. Our guest tonight is the new, relatively new, uh, third district commander of Montgomery County Police Department, uh, Commander Darren Frank, who looks like he's in his office and we're very glad to have you, uh, Commander Frank. Wonder if you could kick this off by uh, telling us what's going on with the district and then maybe answer some questions for the group. Of course, and I, I appreciate uh, you all having me. Alan and I have had a couple conversations uh, over the last year, and, and they're always very meaningful to me and my staff. And, and uh, again, I, I appreciate being here tonight. A little about me, I, I went to high school in Montgomery County. I'm a graduate of uh, Gaithersburg High School uh, and uh, uh, came back down here after college and, and was uh, lucky enough to get a job with the Montgomery County Police. I've been on for 24 years. Uh, I live in uh, Damascus. I've got uh, three daughters and I coach them in softball. I, I, uh, uh, I was married for 24 years. My wife passed away last year and uh, uh, we, uh, we're, we're, we're doing good. And uh, I am, uh, you know, I, I've been blessed to have a good career with Montgomery County and, and uh, Good, keeping me busy, certainly down in uh, Silver Spring. Uh, I, uh, in my career here, I've been the, uh, I've been a major crimes detective. Tom Dagonia had to rail me in a couple, reel me in a couple times, uh, make sure I didn't talk too much on the stand. Um, the uh, so I investigated robberies and homicides. Uh, as a executive with our department, I've I've served in every bureau. I've been the director of the training academy. I've been the uh, executive officer for patrol services. Uh, I was uh, 
the director of major crimes, and I've also been the commander in the first district and now the third district. So again, I'm, 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 uh, I, I do feel very fortunate for the experiences I've had in, in my career. So I figured tonight I'll do two things. Uh, and, and Mel will sm smack me around because he's probably heard these presentations uh, before. He'll make sure he keeps me straight. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about 2020 and what we saw with crime and then go back to February. And with this group, you know, normally I have to focus on one beat or another. Uh, tonight, with you all being from such a wide area, you, you all cover all of our, our sectors. So in the Silver Spring District, we have three sectors. Uh, the George sector, the Henry sector, and the Ida sector. Uh, the George sector is downtown Silver Spring. The Henry sector, pretty much a good, a good explanation that it straddles the area around the Beltway um, and, and going up towards uh, uh, White Oak. And then uh, our Ida sector uh, carries on from White Oak all the way to the Harrah County uh, border. And they're very different. So when I do my stat presentations, we present in stat once a month uh, discussing the issues and the topics that are going on, on in the district. I like to cover all three sectors because they're very different in their makeup. Downtown Silver Spring is very much a uh, urban nightlife area now, much different from when I was a detective down here. Uh, things have grown uh, much taller in downtown. <laughs> um, I don't it, it really really quite interesting how everything has grown up. It's a very lively area, much more than, than it was uh, back when uh, back in the early 2000s, and it's really a testament to uh, uh, what we have going on in this county and in downtown Silver Spring. The Henry sector, a little more established neighborhoods, a uh, uh, little bit calmer uh, for our district, which is good because then we're bordered by the Ida sector that's uh, very busy for us has a lot of multi, uh, multi-family dwelling uh, residences and a uh, couple you know, major arteries. You got 29 going down through there. You got uh, 200 going down, uh, going across. So a very busy area that, that we deal with. Um, so, uh, and, and I will say we've got two of the perhaps busiest sectors that is George Sec George sector is the busiest sector in all the county. And Ida sector is uh, might be about third right now for the busiest. A uh, lot of things going on, and that's the way it's always been. That's why I, I really enjoyed getting the appointment by Chief Jones to be the commander down here. Uh, I don't have time to relax, which is a good thing. Uh, the uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, 2020. So with COVID, there was a lot of challenges uh, with our officers, with making sure that people are safe. Uh, there was also a lot of challenges with people staying home. I mean, during the, during the first part of COVID, we, we had a very marked increase in domestic violence and because people weren't used to being home all the time with each other. I'm happy to say that people have worked through those issues and our domestic violence has, has really leveled off and come down in, in a lot of ways. But, you know, when I talk to folks, I talk about the COVID effect and some of the issues that, that we're seeing that we're having to adapt to and figure out new ways to deal with situations. Also 2020, uh, a, a, a tremendous, uh, what I think is progress uh, towards equity, towards exploring what we do uh, in law enforcement. And really what I hope is, is a continuing discussion about what we do in all of society when it, when it comes to uh, the relations between people uh, in, this, in this country. Um, obviously George Floyd uh, started a wave of um, people asking questions, protests, um, people coming out and saying, look, we can be better. And, and we've accepted that with Montgomery County Police. I will tell you, I'm very proud of, of our department. We, we, uh, we have been a leader uh, in this country in, in progressive reforms. Uh, I think uh, I was on a call earlier today with Council Member uh, 
Albernaz, and we talked about the fact that, you know, a lot of changes uh, that have been asked of law enforcement, Montgomery County Police did years ago. And uh, we, we are proud of that history of leading the way and showing, showing how law enforcement can be done in the, in the realm of community policing and respecting uh, people's rights. So uh, I'm done with my preamble. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the stats of what we saw. And I'm, again, I'm gonna go by the, our, our sectors. So I introduced to you the George sector, downtown Silver Spring. So for 2020, we saw a couple different things. Uh, first, we were able to knock down uh, our larceny and theft defenses. If uh, uh, anyone that's been on any number of meetings with the police, you know that theft from autos is the number one crime in Montgomery County. Uh, and in, in downtown Silver Spring, we were able to keep the numbers down. We, we actually had a reduction 11.4% uh, in theft from autos in downtown Silver Spring. The robbery numbers were down a little bit, about 8% in downtown Silver Spring. And our uh, burglaries were down about 15%. A couple other categories, I mean, we track a lot of categories. Our counterfeiting was down a little bit. Uh, the one, the, the two areas of concerns in downtown Silver Spring that were way up in 2020, and this is a COVID effect thing, uh, motor vehicle thefts. Motor vehicle thefts were up 47%. So per, per uh, perspective, we went from 121 in 2019 to 178 in 2020. And really that came down to people that were uh, uh, going to pick up food and Uber drivers. Um, Uber drivers going to pick up food and, and citizens going to pick up food, leaving their cars running or leaving keys in their cars as they're going to do this and opportunistic individuals, mainly from the District of Columbia and Prince George's County, were waiting and watching and would jump in the cars and roll away. Kind of a thrill crime, but not a thrill for anyone that's uh, a subject of that. Um, so we spent uh, the late, latter part of the year figuring out strategies to uh, work on that. And I'll talk about our strategies when I get into uh, 2021. So uh, that's what we faced in downtown Silver Spring. Carjackings were also up. Now, I, I, when I talk about that, so a carjacking is when you're in control of your vehicle, someone comes up and robs you of your vehicle. Those numbers were way up. Even though I tell you our robberies were down, our carjackings were way up. And again, it's another COVID effect where people were getting out of their cars, leaving it running, they come back with their food and a suspect would approach them and steal their car. Uh, and and uh, with that also came other crimes because those individuals would then carjack the vehicle and go on robbery uh, sprees in either Montgomery County, Prince George's County, uh, Washington, D.C., Fairfax County. And it was, uh, we weren't quite as bad as other jurisdictions. I, I've spoken before. Uh, we are, are lucky. We aren't seeing numbers like in, in D.C., where D.C. was up, I want to say it was 143% in carjackings. We weren't that far up. Uh, we were, I think we were in the 30, up 30% 30 range. Uh, but there are other jurisdictions that are dealing with, uh, and still dealing with carjackings in a, a very profound way. Uh, so that's our George sector for a quick review. And Hold on, I'll make sure I pull up the video in case anyone raises their hands and has a question as I go along. And I encourage anyone if you want to jump in. So our Henry sector, again, a little bit quieter, more established neighborhoods, a lot of residential neighborhoods, um, less calls for service. Oh, going back, downtown Silver Spring, we have a, a, a very substantial homeless population and we have a lot of calls for service related to that. And, and dealing with people that are in crisis that way, whether it be a mental health crisis, a drug-induced crisis, um, uh, or, or, or just being homeless. Uh, we've got a robust uh, health and human services uh, reaction team down there. We're actually building on that in 2021, and that's a very good thing. Um, so uh, back to the Henry sector, 
Henry Sector, we kind of maintain some things. The numbers are pretty much around what they were for 2019 to 2020. And I, and I will tell you that, that, you know, we've had to take a lot of our resources. So I have a district community action team, which is five officers and a sergeant. I have a, um, a special assignment team, which is an undercover unit. Uh, with uh, five detectives and a sergeant. And I've had to put them into our Henry, into our uh, George sector and Ida sector to deal with crime trends. Henry sector, we have dealt with as, as, uh, as best we can. Um, and, but it's stayed pretty level. Uh, our, I, I will say that uh, compared to the other sectors, we, you know, robbery was down 16%. Everything else was kind of in, uh, on par with 2019. We wanna do better there. And, and part of uh, the issue we have is staffing. You know, and I can talk about that later. Uh, and th that's not just a third district problem. It's a staffing uh, across all of Montgomery County and across the nation for law enforcement. So uh, no real, uh, really the trends there had to do with, we had some theft from auto uh, trends, a little bit of an uptick there. And I think it's because we forced people out of the central business district into that area. Uh, a lot of people leave their cars unlocked. 90% yeah. of all theft from autos are preventable uh, by locking your car. Uh, and, and you'll hear us again and again and again, you'll see it on our next door post talking about that. Um, so I'll jump into the Ida sector for 2020. Uh, good reductions, a couple of areas that were higher. Our, our, um, we were able to reduce our larceny and theft offenses by 9%, but our motor vehicle theft were up 7%. So per perspective for the year in 2019, we had 104. 2020, we had 112. Not awful, uh, but certainly we want to do better. The big thing about the Ida sector, so we used to have a, a good number of pack robberies there. Uh, three or four individuals in, in these communities that would go and rob multiple people uh, during the course of a night or over a few weeks. We actually saw a substantial reduction in robberies, 36% down, 61 to 39. And that's a very good thing because those are very traumatizing events uh, for those neighborhoods. Um, our burglaries were down 6%, so that's pretty good. Uh, and uh, let me look at the numbers here. Anything else of interest that may pop out you, uh, at me? Nothing else really there, but um, we worked hard on, on uh, dealing with issues as they came up. We did probably the biggest thing you heard about our Ida sector. So uh, at one point uh, during uh, 2020, we had a bit of an issue with a marijuana distribution turf war. Uh, it occurred uh, uh, around the area of uh, Castle Boulevard, uh, around the area of the Enclave Apartments. So we had to deal with that. Our detectives did a fantastic job. We had a lot, a, a number of victims that were just uncooperative. They didn't want the police involved, but even with those uh, roadblocks in our way, we were able to ultimately make arrests in these crimes. And, uh, and which is an important thing because it, it lets people know that, that it's important to us that we stop this kind of activity. It's important to uh, the residents of these neighborhoods that this, this activity doesn't allow to, uh, doesn't uh, occur. Uh, so we were able to make inroads there. I will say, I'll, I'll get to 2021, I'm starting to see some red flags of that activity again. Um, and our detectives are hard at, hard at work with it. The, uh, in my, so let me jump to, let me ask you that any, any questions on 2020 or anything I've said so far? And Alan, you direct me wherever you want to direct me. No, please continue. Uh, it's fascinating. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I did have, sorry, I did have one quick question sure. for you. Uh, just in the last, um, uh scenario that you were mentioning you know a, a marijuana turf war are we talking about like low level stuff teenagers uh young adults 
uh, on corners? Or are we talking about, you know, some of the more higher organized crime uh, level of it? Just because you mentioned Enclave and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Castle Boulevard. I, I know those areas fairly well and right. some of the residents. So just trying to figure out, like, at, at what level are we talking here? Uh, it's probably right in between that, you know, not the not the guy on the corner, you know, the drug house guy, and, and certainly not an organized crime. You know, when you say the big word organized crime, I mean, they're certainly organized. And that's what that's the issue that's going on here. They're battling for turf for supremacy to, to be the dealer in the area. Um, in, in you know, one of the interesting things, you know, the big discussion, right, is should marijuana be legal, uh, illegal, you know, what do we want to do as a society? Um, you know, for Montgomery County, and I can say this from the, from being the major crimes, uh, director investig investigating all the homicides we have, uh, all of the drug related homicides we have are over marijuana. Um, these assaults that we had were over marijuana. They're not over cocaine. They're not over heroin. They're not over, it, it, it's none of those drugs. It's marijuana. Um, and uh, what you'll see nationwide and California is a great example of this, of the legalization of marijuana is that uh, when you start taxing it, it becomes more expensive and the black market uh, on marijuana increases and goes up. And that's where you get, you know, they, they also have issues there uh, with turf wars and so forth, even though it's legal. Um, so it's kind of middle of the road. The people are armed. Uh, which is of concern, and I'll talk about ghost guns in a minute. Um, we're, we're entering a time where the uh, really, you know, so I've been doing this for, for 24, going on 25 years, the proliferation of, of uh, or availability of guns, probably that's the better word for it. The availability of guns that I've seen over the last year and over the last three months has been quite astonishing. And, and a lot of that has to do with ghost guns. And I'll talk to that in a second. So middle of the road and, you know, you got a house full of people that are battling another house full of people. That's literally what we had going on last year. Um, uh, two separate neighborhood groups that we were able to crack down on, but not like a syndicate that's like uh, spread across the DMV area or anything like that. Does that answer your question, Jacob? Perfectly. I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, so now I'll jump ahead to the beginning of the year. Uh, so with the challenge, you know, we, we have a lot of challenges that we're facing right now. The COVID, COVID type crimes of opportunity that we've seen created. And also, uh, you know, we're in the middle of reimagining policing, right? Uh, I think a lot of people saw the report uh, that the county executive uh, commission that came out and we're in the middle of looking at where we want to be in Montgomery County, where, what we want our police to do, uh, what we uh, expect of our police and uh, the, a lot of discussions and very important discussions about, about race, about equity. Uh, and again, I'll say, I hope it goes beyond the police because, you know, I had the chance to take part in, well, first of all, we had 30 plus protests in the Silver Spring District last year, uh, resulting out of George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor and, and other events. And, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that not, there wasn't a single arrest. There wasn't a single use of force during all of these protests. They were peace. Some tough words spoken. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, everyone got a chance to, to say their piece. So we're in the middle of that process, figuring out where we're going. So it causes us, causes my officers and causes my leadership to them uh, to find thoughtful ways to deal with issues um, as we go through this process and to make sure that uh, our citizens are safe, to make sure officers are safe and, and the community as a whole are safe. So a lot, a lot of challenges there, and we can talk more about that later. But so, for example, let, let me let me report out on on February. So our George sector downtown, we went through uh, a period where we had a, a, a great number of auto thefts and uh, carjackings at the end of the year. 
I pushed a lot of my resources in the downtown into the downtown Silver Spring area. We also had threats from uh, protest from uh, obviously there was the January 6th insurrection and there was uh, uh, issues surrounding threats of issues surrounding the inauguration. So I felt it very important to protect downtown Silver Spring. Uh, it's a vital area and it's also very easily accessible by people coming out of DC, not so much in Henry sector and Ida sector. So we had a lot of resources out, out there and we've also kind of changed our deployments to a degree. I've directed a bunch of high visibility uh, posts throughout the district. So basically my, my uh, crime analyst, my lieutenants, uh, determine areas where we have heightened crime levels of, of different things. And we assign the officers to those areas so that when they're not actively responding to a call, they're to be in these areas in a highly visible manner. Uh, I, I'm still uh, figuring out a way to uh, analyze the data to see if the causality is there, but I'm very pleased with the results so far. Uh, so for the George sector, where we were having a, a bunch of auto thefts, a bunch of carjackings, you know, for February, uh, we were down 35% in our larcenies, our theft from autos, our, our general thefts. We were down 73% in February from between 2020 and 2021. We were down uh, 73% in auto thefts. Uh, we were down 60% in burglaries for, for February. Uh, we were down 51% for destruction, uh, destruction crimes, vandalisms, uh, 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 damage to uh, personal property. So really good reductions down there. We poured a lot of resources in there. Now, would it be some of it weather related? I don't recall last February be being so difficult with the weather. It could be. And that's one of the one, it's one of the hard things. I'd love to you know tell you that we did some genius thing that caused these reductions. We have to evaluate that and see what it actually truly is. Uh, I was on a meeting earlier today, and I did talk about the first few days of March. Unfortunately, our theft from autos are up right now uh, for the first uh, week of March. Uh, our um, uh, robberies. Our robberies for March, for March, were about on par, but I will say for February of 2021, our robberies were very high. We were up 300%. Now, to qualify that, we had two robberies in, two, in, in, in February of 2020. We had two robberies in the downtown area. In 2021, in February, we had eight. Now, all of those were related to a specific group coming out of D.C., or the, I'm sorry, six of the eight were, were related to a group coming out of D.C. And what they would do is they'd come up, they'd carjack someone, they'd rob someone, rob someone else, go back down into D.C. Uh, we set up a pretty robust task force with uh, uh, Metropolitan PD, Prince George's County Police, our police department, Fairfax, and there's a couple other agencies involved as well. We were actually able to arrest someone coming away from one of these carjackings. And that person ended up confessing to other crimes, giving us names. So we've closed uh, six out of those eight, which is a very good thing because I'll tell you as someone who used to investigate carjackings, um, in fact, carjackings in Silver Spring back in oh, 2000, 2002, 2003, um, 2004, they're very difficult uh, to close because people just drive the vehicle into DC, into PG or Montgomery County, although we haven't seen that yet uh, currently, but they just drive it and drop it and that's it. There's, there's nothing coming away from it. Uh, if you get, you might get lucky and get a print, but that, you know, then you would have to make sure that you, you're, then you're relying on the fact that whoever did it had been arrested before and fingerprinted properly. So uh, they are difficult cases. So I'm, I'm very pleased that we were able to do that. Um, so George sector, good, good reductions. And moving on to Henry sector, again, a lot of good reductions. Uh, motor vehicle theft, we're down 62%. Uh, robberies, all right. So I could say, well, we were down 33% in robberies in, in the Henry sector. But to be honest, 
in 2020, there were three robberies. In 2021, there were two robberies. So uh, fun with numbers. I'll just be honest with you about what, what the numbers are. Um, but uh, our destructions and damaged uh, vandalism crimes were down 33%. So all good reductions It's what we want to see happening uh, and, and what we want to continue to see happening uh, across our, our, our county. The, um, uh, I'll jump to the Ida sector. Uh, so Ida, uh, we had a uptick in burglaries. We had some commercial burglaries, I'm happy to say. Uh, so we had some commercial burglaries of restaurants. We were up 66%. So we went from six in 2020 to 10 in 2021. Again, our detectives done a very nice job. An individual was arrested in another jurisdiction. We're waiting on a full debrief on that, but we're fairly confident we're gonna close that uptick uh, that we saw in February for that. Um, our larcenies, again, down 29%, very good thing. Our motor vehicle thefts were down 40%. But again, going back to the one thing we have seen, and Chief Jones has talked about this violent crime, we have seen an uptick in aggravated assaults and robberies. So our robberies were up 200%. So we went from two to six in February up in our Ida sector. Um, we continue to work these cases. Uh, these are uh, mainly street robberies, uh, not pack robberies, but they're, they're street robberies. Uh, and our investigators are working hard but again, we, we continue to run into, unfortunately, we run into individuals that don't want to be overly cooperative with the police. Um, and that can be for any number of reasons. The main, number, main reason we see is because they're involved in the drug trade and this happens to be a, a drug ripoff or something of that nature. Um, so uh, good work by our officers there and I can go into example after example, but. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll jump into my focus on, on what we've been talking about as of late, some of the issues we're seeing. We're seeing this uptick in robberies. We're seeing this uptick in violent crimes. It's very concerning. And to go with that are these ghost guns. So uh, for anyone that doesn't know what a ghost gun is, so most, most guns you have to buy through a dealer. You have to have a background check. The gun is serialized. Uh, handguns are test fired so that there's a round and there's a, there's a uh, record of the grooves that go with the guns. Uh, so there's a whole process there. A big loophole in, in the federal laws has to do with these kit guns. So a manufacturer can put together a kit and to get through the loophole from the ATF, they have to make the, uh, you know, and generally it's the receiver, the receiver, the lower part of the gun is not fully finished. So when you get it, the gun is not operational. And so when this law went into effect, when these loopholes, well, what I'm calling a loophole, went into effect, they were designed for uh, uh, gunsmiths so that they can get a gun and make a gun. And, and they had all kinds of equipment, right? Drill presses, uh, uh, tap and die sets, you know, much more advanced than most people have and much more precision work. Well, what's happened is manufacturers have seen the loophole. Uh, consumers that want to be in the business of, of uh, producing guns and distributing guns uh, have seen the loophole. So they've created these receivers so that you basically only have to drill a couple things that I could do with the drill out in my garage. And so these people are creating these guns. We are taking, uh, I believe Chief Smith, I think they calculated in the last, uh, since the beginning of 2021, we've, I'm sorry, no, this was a 2020 number. So 2019, I think we recovered 20, 24 ghost guns. 2021, we've recovered uh, about 67, close to 70 ghost guns. And I will tell you from reading the reports in 2021, the rate is continuing to climb. Uh, because again, you order this kit through the mail, you drill a couple holes and you have a gun. And there's no serial number on it. 
There's no background check on it. Uh, there's no reason to go through uh, an FFL. Um, the, uh, uh, it, it is an easy way for people to make money if they buy the kit and then they sell it on the, they put it together and then they sell it um, uh, to someone on the street. And so we're seeing more and more of these. Every other night, um, our officers across the district are making traffic stops uh, where they end up pulling guns out of cars. So it's a very, uh, it, it really is quite amazing to see the proliferation that we've seen. Uh, it's disturbing too, how many people we're running into uh, that are armed. Uh, it's much like, much unlike what we've seen over, over the years uh, past. So uh, I do know that council member, uh, the county council is looking at legislation about ghost guns it certainly needs to be looked at, looked at at a national level uh, because it is out there and it is getting bigger uh, and the problem is just going to continue to increase until we have some penalties to go along with these, uh, uh, certainly possession of a gun by a person that's uh, prohibited. And, and that's what we see a lot. People that are prohibited due to their criminal history are getting these guns. And we're seeing that often with uh, the, when we take these guns off of people. Uh, it's, not, it's not, you know, Joe Smith and, 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 and Bob Henry that are uh, just, you know, buying something for their house for protection. It's people that are prohibited, that know there's this loophole that are getting their hands on guns. And they're the people that have been convicted of crimes of violence before uh, that are that are now armed again and and causing problems for our community. Um, so that's a breakdown of what we saw in 2020, what we're seeing right now. And there's many other things I can talk about as I've already babbled on for a long time. So again, I'll throw it open and uh, anyone have any questions uh, or Alan, you, I see a hand over here, Justin. Uh, Justin, do you want to answer your answer? Ask your question. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, has District Three had to help resolve uh, COVID mask wearing disputes uh, violations? Uh, are these disputes or violations increasing uh, or decreasing? And how are these disputes violations being tracked? So. Uh... They're being tracked in, in our database. So all of our calls that come into our emergency communication center are tracked. Uh, they, they would be tracked in that manner. Uh, I can tell, I, I mean, I haven't asked for a lookup of, of uh, data every month on the events. What I will tell you at the beginning of COVID, we had many more complaints as people were getting used to wearing masks and, and were being required to wear masks. Uh, those have lessened. I haven't really seen any of the, uh, we've had a couple individuals that have uh, gone into uh, businesses, mostly in downtown Silver Spring, that refused to wear masks. But those people were, were individuals that uh, were either uh, homeless or have very significant mental health issues. Uh, it, it really hasn't been a political thing for us in the third district. Uh, since the beginning of this, our state's attorney's office has indicated that they're not going to prosecute uh, violations of, of mask wearing. And Chief Jones uh, has uh, advocated a policy of, of uh, uh, education and seeking compliance. And we've been very successful with that. Um, having, Have you had any business? Have you had any business owners uh, ask you to enforce like uh, trespassing laws uh, because people were not uh, behaving what they felt was appropriate? Regarding masks? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to recall if I can, if we've had any incidents reference masks. I mean, we've certainly had business owners that asked for people to be trespassed. Those usually have to do with theft and disorderly conduct. Um, if we do have any reference masks, it's very, very few. Uh, I, again, okay. I, see, I see it having to do with uh, thefts and the disorderly conduct more than masks. Okay. 
I've got a question which came in via Facebook for you, Commander. Okay. I won't mention the guy's name. He says he's concerned about growing drug trafficking and illegal gun activity in his apartment building on Thayer Avenue in Silver Spring, okay. which, he believe, which he believes is forcing tenants to consider leaving Silver Spring. I wonder what your advice is for um, that gentleman. So uh, certainly if you see illegal activity, you know, see something, say something and, and uh, uh, call the 301-279-8000. If it's a crime of violence, obviously 911. And our officers, uh, our officers will do their best to get there quickly and try and deal with it. You know, the marijuana use is a very interesting thing. I, I, I suppose I'm assuming that it's, it's marijuana use. Downtown Silver Spring, we see a couple different things. Uh, we see marijuana use. Uh, we also see K, uh, use of other drugs like K2, um, sometimes heroin, but that's usually amongst the um, uh, homeless population uh, that we see those concerns. The marijuana we see in a number of buildings, we get a lot of complaints. You know, one of the hard things for us is, uh, so we have this discussion going on in society. What, what do we want to do? And in Montgomery County, what do we want to do about marijuana use? Uh, so um, it's a civil violation, you know, simple possession is civil violation, and, and that, or that's where it is now, as opposed to when I started as a criminal violation. Uh, and we're also seeing people with uh, 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 prescriptions for medical marijuana, which makes it even more difficult, right? Uh, the, I'll give an example. There's an address in the Henry sector on Balmoral Drive. We've, we've uh, unfortunately, that street there, there was a house there where we've had two homicides over the last eight months, not to do with marijuana, but some concerns out of the neighborhood had to do with, you know, someone's using marijuana uh, uh, in front of their house. And so I put my officers to work on it. And what we found out is the person that lived there had a prescription. So we do our best to thoughtfully deal with uh, these issues. Again, it's very complex, especially now with reimagining policing. It's not as clear cut as it was when I started on this department. And uh, we try and be thoughtful and assess each situation on its own. Um, and uh, the, so back around to my advice to this individual is, is, uh, certainly report activity that you think is criminal. We will, uh, uh, get there as quick as we can realizing we're dealing with some other things too. Uh, you know, I've talked about the violent crime and, and issues with, uh, people that are in uh, crisis, uh, that my, uh, my officers have to respond to but we'll do our best to assess each situation and, and, and figure out what we can do with it. There's a couple of quick questions in the chat. One is what's the dividing line between the George and Henry sectors? And the second one is, will the ride along program be restored at some point? Uh, ride along program, I think when our, as our numbers continue downward with uh, COVID, uh, we'll go to restore that, but that's gonna be based on uh, the recommendations that are coming out of uh, uh, our, our uh, task force, uh, Dr. Gales is dealing with that, and we'll we'll kind of build on that as we go. Um, the uh, certainly, again, as we see vaccinations continue and everyone get their get their chance, we'll figure out a thoughtful way to do that. You know, whether it's a requirement of a vaccination. One of the things that we can't have, and one of the unknowns, is how long these vaccinations last for, and and what they actually mean. Um, you know, for us, a department that's so, that we are very understaffed. And I'll give you an example. Uh, three weeks ago, I had uh, uh, basically an entire shift, uh, basically an entire sector team taken out of service because they were exposed uh, during an arrest situation, uh, which creates issues because I, we got to fill positions with overtime. It's not the beat officers that are going to be in the neighborhood dealing with issues. So we want to avoid that. So when the numbers get to where they are, I believe we will resume that. I think it's a very great tool um, to get people to see what the police department is dealing with and kind of educate them about their community. Um, 
I thought that was going to be the quick answer. What, what was the second part of that, Alan? The dividing line. I, I, I kind of consider it right about the, the belt, uh, right basically on either side of the beltway going through there. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name, the, the name of the one road, but um, I'll look it up real quick. But right around the beltway is the Henry sector. Uh, I'll try and pull that up on a map to give you a better explanation than that. Um, another, another question in the chat is from uh, Dory Pastor. Can you talk about the unhoused population uh, in Georgia a bit more? Do you see increases or decreases? How are you coordinating with social services and private entities? What do you see coming in the future? And what do you see as the most serious issues to all populations? Uh, reference the homelessness. Well, let's talk about the homeless, yeah. Yeah, so we've seen an increase and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, people in need, uh, the tremendous outreach that Montgomery County government does to the homeless. And, and also we've had some issues elsewhere in the county that's kind of created downtown Silver Spring as the hub for uh, outreach to homeless individuals. Uh, up on Goody Drive, uh, we've had the shelter there uh, shut down to, due to age and we've had an influx there. DC, we've seen people come up from DC to get services, to get help uh, because DC has, uh, uh, from what I'm told, have, have uh, cut down on uh, or have come down on, on certain aspects of providing services. Uh, we, uh, shoot, I have a number in my email somewhere about the number of meals that or number of people we serve on a daily basis. I don't want to quote it without having it. But so downtown Silver Spring is very much a hub for this. And a couple of different issues, you know, between COVID and between restaurants not wanting to create an environment where people are hanging out all day, you know, uh, we have people that, we have individuals that have, uh, you know, issues like uh, uh, defecating or urinating on the sidewalks, very detrimental to the business environment in downtown Silver Spring. Um, and, and some of those individuals do it because they just can. Some of them do it because they have extraordinary mental health issues. We've got one individual we've been dealing with for a year. I'm happy to say right now he's um, right now he's in a uh, uh, mental health institution getting help. But but this individual is just uh, uh, really significantly impaired and would uh, defecate and urinate on the sidewalks. Um, credit to the county executive, we've put comfort stations in downtown Silver Spring to decrease that activity. We'll see what happens coming out of uh, the winter um, and uh, going into the spring and summer to see if those stations are used more and we kind of decrease that behavior. Uh, so I, I will say our HHS does uh, outreach all the time. And if there are people that want housing, they get housing. One of the challenges we run into is people that don't want help. And so for us, a lot of people have heard about the criminalization of the homeless, which is a kind of a broad brush, uh, a, a broad brush statement that people make. There's a lot of things that go into uh, dealing with the uh, homeless community. And I will tell you, my officers don't want to criminalize anyone. Uh, that, that, that's not what they got into the, uh, this profession for. They got into the profession to help people and to keep a peaceful community to make sure everyone can, can enjoy, be good neighbors and, and, and have a good experience. Um, so you have people that defecate and urinate, but you also have people that take advantage of situations. The, the poor 7-Eleven down on Georgia Avenue, well, there's actually a number of the 7-Elevens, the uh, there is thievery going on a, a lot of thievery going on um, and it's and it's and and it affects these businesses a, a great deal um, and disorderly conduct uh, aggressive panhandlers things of that nature now my, my officers don't want to criminalize anyone uh, but there, there is a responsibility to be good neighbors I, I think and I think we're starting to have that conversation about uh, drawing lines between this broad brush of uh, call, saying that any any enforcement action with a homeless person is criminalizing them and just talking about being good neighbors. So we want to educate people on how to be a good neighbor. 
Uh, for us, when we deal with situations and people in crisis, we like to call the health and human services first, get them to come out and speak with individuals, offer them help. Um, but I will tell you, a number of people just don't want help. And they'll tell the health and human services people, yep, nope, no thanks. And they'll continue about their business. And that's one of the things we're trying to get a handle on. How do we deal with that? Uh, how do we establish those boundaries of being a good neighbor and getting people help, especially mm. people that don't want help? It's challenging. Uh, and honestly, we're in the middle of figuring it out. I will say uh, we have made strides in the last month in hiring extra health and human services people uh, to be a crisis response, to go out and deal with individuals uh, and be the first line of, of uh, help to these individuals. You know, part of, you know, one of the interesting things about policing and the, is that we're, we're going through with this reimagining policing is for many, many years, um, there's been one group of people that you can call 24 seven with any problem. Someone's always going to pick up the phone. A person is always going to pick up the phone. And really when you see our, the calls we respond to, we get sent to just about anything and that's the police. And, um, uh, and, and I'm not saying, you know, not saying it's right, but, uh, folks have an expectation of, of, uh, someone coming to help, yeah, whether it sure. be with a neighbor dispute, whether it be with someone in a mental health crisis, they expect someone to be there. So we've had to fill that role for years. And now I think what we're seeing through efforts of the county council, the county executive, through our health and human services, we're starting to see pieces get put into place that instead of the police being put in these situations, we have a good deal of training. But certainly we're, we're, we're not as well trained as a, a uh, psycholologist. We're not as well trained as someone that uh, receives a, a college education in, in how to do crisis intervention. We're seeing more of those people get it put into place, which is a good thing because they can be called first and try and do this uh, intercept and get people the resources they need. And then we can talk about the police and, and um, you know, do we need to step in at some point? But it's still a very difficult conversation. But I do see the ramping up of resources. Uh, again, I think Mel was on a call with me earlier today where we talked, uh, they hired two of three individuals that had been authorized and that was a long time coming. So that's a, that's a positive, positive step forward and we continue to make those uh, steps forward. You mentioned the uh, reimagining public safety task force. There's a question from Facebook. The county executives uh, reimagining public safety task force made the following recommendation. How do the police officers think that the implementation of the recommendation would affect public safety? And the re recommendation from the task force was reduce sworn officers, FTEs and police districts three and four by 50% to reduce patrol officer contact with residents in these districts the more than $12 million saved from these reductions should be shifted by the county executive to other agencies. What's uh, your thought about uh, reducing your, your, your workforce by uh, 50%? So uh, I have a little bit of experience this. I, I, was the, I was the individual that did the last workload analysis for the Montgomery County Police uh, back in 2011, 2012. Back then, with 180,000 less citizens, we were 300, 300, a minimum of 300 officers uh, below what we should be staffed for the workload. So I come at, it, at, at this question from that perspective. Uh, when you talk about answering calls for service, meeting minimum response times for emergencies, and also having time to do community engagement and community policing, which is generally around a 40% number. We are very much understaffed. Uh, reducing, uh, it's a bold idea, uh, but I think uh, with everything in the report, um, it, it's important that we continue to look at it and we continue to look at thoughtful solutions for it. Um, it would be very difficult, and Chief Jones has said this, it would be very difficult to reduce the number of officers in three and 4D, our two busiest districts by 50% uh, 
40%, 30%. There's too much work going on. Um, one of the things we don't have data on is uh, by having officers, what does it prevent? It's actually one of the conversations about SROs because uh, you know, one of the things that we like to talk about, thankfully, knock on wood, is, you know, we haven't had a school shooting. In fact, we've had things that were, were avoided by SROs being there. Uh, but how do you exactly measure that deterrence effect? Regarding reducing officers, it'd be very, very difficult. There is a lot of work to do. Um, and there's a lot more we want to do with community engagement. Uh, I will tell you, my officers would love to go to neighborhoods and, and, and be part of barbecues and, and, and uh, uh, you know, just walk down the street and say hi to folks. I mean, that is really ideal. That's what we want. We want a great uh, community that, that everyone is invested in. Um, and if we could get there, uh, fantastic. Um, that's what we're aiming for. And, and uh, I just, uh, it would be very difficult, I guess, with my, I've said it a couple of times, look at me. Uh, very difficult to do. I, I don't, I, but I think we can look at things um, along those lines as far as our interactions. How do, we, how do we guide our interactions? One of the things we've done in the third district is I put forward a, a, a vision for, for my officers based on procedural justice. So when you talk about interactions with people, Maybe instead of lessening the interactions, the, let's, make, let's make the interactions meaningful. Let's ensure that uh, our officers are listening to our citizens, no matter what they're doing. They could be a suspect. They could be uh, a, a really nice person walking their dog. They could be any number of things. Let's make sure our officers are listening to people, respecting people, and being fair to people. That's really what people, are, that's, what, that's what folks are looking for. That's part of the human condition. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, anything about uh, uh, human psychology, you know, that, that's, that's a big thing that people are looking for. So uh, what we've done in the third district is we, we put a big emphasis on procedural justice. And that's where I'm driving my officers forward, that uh, no matter what, no matter what anyone's class, creed or condition is, we treat everyone with respect, give them a voice. Uh, my experience through my career is that when you do that, even when you arrest a murderer, even when you arrest someone for robbery, for domestic violence, you respect people, you give them a voice, you give them a chance to say what they wanna say. And at the end of it, even if you're arresting someone, uh, there is a mutual respect there uh, that is created just by that, that touch. So uh, that's what we're doing in the third district. And I hope to continue on with that because I do think, the, the other thing I'll say to this is, uh, I've been in the neighborhoods where they need us the most. I've talked with the residents. I've had really some profound experiences through the protests over this last year and then my community engagements that I'm doing. And resoundingly, I don't hear anyone saying we want less police in these neighborhoods in the third district. They're saying we want more police. We want more positive interactions. We want to see you more. We want to... We want, I'm actually working on an adopt a block program uh, with one neighborhood uh, to find an officer there that kind of be the liaison there. It's something new we we're gonna try. But that's what we're hearing from the neighborhoods. Um, and and uh, we, hope, we, we wanna continue working on that. So one of the things that we care about a lot, Safe Silver Spring is pedestrian safety. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of emphasis from the county executive and the county council about education, engineering, and enforcement. Mm -hmm. A recent meeting we had on pedestrian safety, lots of people raised the question of whether or not there's enough enforcement and how enforcement uh, can be uh, improved, especially places like University Boulevard. I mean, that always comes to mind, uh, George Avenue with uh, speeding. So I'd ask you, what are you doing on pedestrian safety? And then another thing that I think that came from the reimagining task force was uh, having law enforcement do less traffic stops and uh, rely more on automated um, enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as what my officers are doing, and this goes back to the concept of a high visibility. 
So one of the things during COVID, we wanted to limit officers' uh, interactions with people because, again, we can't have we can't have the public safety force depleted due to COVID because, you know, if someone gets exposed, whether or not they're positive or not, they're shut down for 14 days. Um, they're, uh, I'm sorry, the guidelines keep going back and forth. At one point, it was 21, it's 14, I think it's 10 now. Uh, I got a lieutenant that handles this whole business. Um, and uh, so we wanted to reduce those contacts. So what we've moved to is, and because of the reimagined policing, because there's a lot of questions uh, about the uh, OLL report on people we've stopped and, and do, we, do we stop peop uh, more people of color uh, inappropriately. So uh, right now at this time, uh, we've moved to high visibility posts. My officers are directed by data from our traffic division and through complaints I get into my office. My traffic sergeants assign motor officers and also uh, give details to uh, my patrol officers to do at the very least high visibility posts in trouble areas uh, where we might have a pedestrian issue, we might have a speeding issue. Uh, Burtonsville Crossing comes to mind. We've had issues with uh, uh, car meets, which is another um, COVID related issue that has uh, developed uh, over the last year. Uh, so our sergeant uh, and, and I and the lieutenants direct people to do that. Um, I, I will tell you, uh, when we were doing pedestrian uh, safety issues and, and, and stopping pedestrians for, uh, 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 unfortunately, one of the things that we've seen with our pedestrian fatalities is a good number of them are for people are not crossing it at uh, crosswalks uh, that are crossing mid-block. And there's a number of reasons for that. But some of our most contentious interactions have been stopping those individuals uh, and, and trying to educate them on why this is so dangerous uh, to do. So we've been trying to be thoughtful in it. Uh, I will say that Chief Jones uh, has received approval to move forward with a plan, uh, a reorganization plan for a centralized motor unit. Uh, we're working towards putting that centralized motor unit into effect uh, by uh, July of this year. And uh, that will heighten the ability of these uh, traffic officers to respond to data. Well, you know, we, what we want to do is 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 be uh, guiding our actions on data that we receive about where crashes are, where pedestrian issues are. So once that centralized unit comes online, you're going to see more data driven than we've ever done before. Um, and and again, getting out there and, and addressing those issues. I will tell you, in my studies of traffic enforcement. Uh, uh, from the from the scholarly work that I've read, even the lightest touch uh, can alter behaviors of drivers. So um, you know, I've been encouraging my folks uh, write warnings, write tickets, whatever you want, whatever you need to do. Let's do something, and it can be the lightest thing. Uh, I used to do a lot of warnings, uh, verbal warnings. I can't do that anymore. We just changed our policy. It's one of the things that is coming out of uh, uh, reimagining policing. At a minimum now, we have to uh, issue a, a written warning uh, or some sort of other paperwork rather than a verbal warning. So that's a change for us and we're gonna implement that change. Um, but uh, uh, we, you know, uh, going to your question on the automated enforcement, you know, the automated enforcement works. There's a reason that it's around. Uh, and also it's a light touch, right? You, if, you get, if you pull over a driver and give them a ticket, uh, that's going to MVA, that's against the driver, your insurance company gets involved, insurance rates go up, uh, you know, for a moving violation like speeding or something like that. And, you know, that can be very impactful on a family as, uh, as well, especially in the times of COVID. Uh, the automated enforcement is a civil violation. It's a fine, so it's going to impact someone, but the long-term effect isn't there. I think there's, it's certainly, we certainly need to look at that as an option. Uh, I know our county council and county executive are looking at that as, as an option of putting more responsibility with our, traf with our uh, civilian traffic partners. 
And again, another bold idea that's come out of reimagined policing and we'll see where it goes. It's worth exploring. Uh, I don't think any of us know where it's going to end up, but if we don't, if we don't try things, if we don't at least ponder them and, and, and experiment with them, we'll, we'll never know what kind of a difference they can make, so. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, Mel, do you wanna ask your question? Uh-oh. No, it's not that bad. Uh, <laughs> Commander- Mel gives uh, me tough questions, go ahead, sir. No, no, this is, um, you know, as you said, there's a lot of, um, talk about uh, uh, Alan's idea of reducing the uh, number of police officers 50%. It's not that, my idea. <laughs> so that other uh, ways of doing things could, uh, could be tried. And, and my question is, is there anybody thinking about maybe trying these other ways of doing things before, you know, find out whether they work? before actually cutting the number of police officers? Um, absolutely. What I'll tell you is, you know, my peers, the other, the other commanders at the districts, uh, we are, are given uh, chief, started under Chief Manger and is continuing on with Chief Jones and, and Assistant Chief Willie Parker alone. You know, we are given uh, a lot of autonomy to, to find ways to deal with problems under a community policing model. You know, it, it's, I, I guess I'll go on my rant on that. I've seen people talk about, well, we don't do community policing. That's all I've ever known my entire career is, is doing community policing. Uh, we don't just go, I, I don't issue orders from upon high. You need to go write 300 tickets uh, in this neighborhood. I never done that, never seen it. What we'd like to do is partner with people and find, uh, and you guys are gonna get sick of me using the word thoughtful, but it's the only way I can think of uh, how to express it. Thoughtful ways to deal with community issues. Um, and that, that involves bringing in other agencies, uh, other county agencies, bringing in nonprofit organizations, bringing in uh, schools, bringing, I mean, all kinds of people, bringing in neighborhood organizations and seeing how you can best attack a problem. So uh, what I like to do is uh, uh, I, I do like to celebrate our victories and show the really great plans and great uh, and interactions that we have to show that, that uh, number one, you need a lot of people to do these things. Uh, Balmoral Drive is a great example. I'm working with that neighborhood due to, as I referenced before, the two homicides and some things going on there. But uh, I've needed a lot of officers to watch over that neighborhood, to deal with problems coming out of a couple houses. But we've also, with those number of officers and those, those uh, uh, contacts that we've made, we've dealt, we've dealt with our health and human services. We dealt with uh, Department of uh, Housing and Community Affairs. We've dealt with uh, our county attorneys. We've dealt with code enforcement. We, I, I, the list goes on of the people that, uh, Adult Protective Services, of all the people that we've engaged in solving this problem, it takes a lot of people to do that. I need a lot of people to do uh, that kind of work. And I think we're finding a, a good solution to that problem there. And there's uh, certainly other examples I have of where we've done this, but uh, making those connections take people. And, and, and uh, the more we can show that and show that it's, it's not just it's not just uh, backing off someplace and just seeing what, what will happen. It's positive interactions, it's respect for our community and, and developing really, really good interactions that, that uh, requires people. And I, and I think that's bearing out. I think we're seeing that. I've got another Facebook question. It is, uh, how do you deal with people who don't speak English as their native language? So we're getting more and more officers that, that do speak multiple languages. Uh, we continually work on the diversity of our, of our department. Uh, it, it is a priority. The, uh, uh, so uh, in, so in, in uh, and this is one of the good things being the commander of Silver Spring, I get all the young officers. I get, I get all these kids out of college and, and really, you know, the interesting thing, so my daughters all have to take a language in high school. They have to. 
uh, when I went to high school, I, I, I got away with, I think I got out of there with like a year and a half of German or something. I don't know what it was, but I was able to skate, uh, skate and that wasn't a good thing for me. I, I really do wish I, I had had a, uh, I had someone forcing me to do something that would actually be smart for me, which is, is, is become immersed in another language. But with uh, our education system now, that's, that's much more of a focus and we're seeing uh, more officers are bilingual and I get all the young officers. So we have a number of officers that speak Spanish. Um, and that, that's the big one that we, that's the big one we deal with. We also have resources in the language line uh, that we can call on as, as needed. Uh, so we have a lot of resources. I really haven't run into a situation where we didn't, we weren't able to hook someone up uh, with a translator that got us to where we needed to be as far as an investigation or rendering aid to someone. Uh, let's go to uh, until nine o'clock. So 10 more minutes. If anybody has some questions for the committee. I have a question. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, earlier, you spoke about social services. I was wondering if uh, because people are so cooped up, if you're having an increase in uh, child abuse, and if you are, are you satisfied with the services that are available for those families? Yeah, uh, so uh, we have a good captain over there, Captain Amy Dom. She's done a very good job monitoring our trends. Really, uh, the, uh, uh, the child, we, we've investigated the child, any child abuses we have, but we haven't really seen an uptick there. The uptick we've seen uh, again, at the beginning of COVID was with the domestic violence uh, between partners. I, I, I will say with the law change and with better education for our officers, we've seen an increased number, an increased focus on strangulation. Uh, the, that was a crime that, uh, or well, first of all, it's, it's always been a crime. Uh, it's been an aggravated assault, but we've trained our officers better on how to recognize that. So we're getting more of those cases. And, and again, I think it's a combination of, I think a lot of it has to do with education for our officers. We're constantly training them. So they're recognizing these very serious assaults and dealing with that. Um, no issues on the, on the child. I mean, certainly any assault on a child is bad, but I, we haven't seen a, a very significant uptick there. That's good news. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Commander Frank, can you just circle back to the issue of school resource officers and tell us how you feel about uh, that aspect of uh, your portfolio? So, you know, back when I started, there were no school resource officers, but we also had permanent. Uh, we also had shifts that rotate. So a lot of a lot of the officers, you know, we'd, we'd work day work, evening and then midnights and so we had kind of a, a, a very broad experience uh, with our communities. So on day work, we knew we had, to, we had to deal with school issues. We didn't have SROs to rely on. And we had our basic education that came out of the academy. Uh, and then our experiences in, in dealing with issues at the school during those times. Our SROs, despite what, what folks want to say, are very highly trained. Uh, so they have their college education. And, you know, I hear that, well, you know, police in other countries send their, you know, they, they send their police to school for years. Well, that's because they don't have the college requirement we have. You know, we, 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 at a minimum, you have to have 60 credits to be a Montgomery County police officer. And if you want to uh, be promoted, you got to have, a, you got to have 120 credits and then you get into degrees and things like that. So we have college educated officers who then go through uh, what is now a 26 week academy, then a 14 week field training program. Um, and then uh, every year have retraining requirements and new topic requirements from MPC, uh, the uh, Maryland Police Training Commission. And then when you're selected as an SRO, you have to apply for the position and you have, you're interviewed by uh, uh, officers and a principal of a school. Those principals sit in on the interview uh, and after that, you get another 40 hours, basic 40 hours of training in how to be an SRO. And then you get retraining every year. And then you have the DARE program, which is another 80 hours of training. 
And then you have, I, I mean, the training goes on and on. So these officers, first of all, they applied for this position to interact with these kids. And that's a fantastic thing. I will tell you, I've, our SROs, the most diverse unit on our, on our uh, department, they're mm -hmm. highly trained and uh, they're invested in making these positive interactions with kids and keeping a safe school environment. So you've heard a lot about the uh, uh, school to prison pop line, uh, pipeline, right? Montgomery County has 160,000 plus students. Uh, last school year, even though it was a little bit shortened, 269 total students were charged either via paper or physical arrest. The physical arrests were only 20, I want to say there were 27, 27 physical arrests. And those were crimes for like robbery, weapon possession, aggravated assault, 269 students out of 160,000. And I will tell you 90%, 97% of those arrests were brought to SRO's attention from school administrators. School administrators, is a serious problem here. We need our SROs to deal with this. Uh, I got uh, two fantastic SROs right now. I got three high schools. I have a vacancy right now because my one um, uh, Corporal Junior, well, it, she was promoted, um, Corporal Junius, she was fantastic. Uh, I got Willie Taft, I got Brandon McLeod, uh, uh, both African-American uh, men, who are in schools that are very diverse, making really positive connections with these students. I know there have been people that testified and, and about uncomfortable uh, issues, but uh, there's a lot of other people that have had really terrific interactions with these SROs. And uh, going back to what I said, you know, how do you measure uh, preventive stuff? You know, we are blessed that we haven't had a school shooting. Uh, is that a, a function of having an SRO there? Maybe, uh, perhaps, uh, I'd like to think so. But what I can tell you is statistics on school shootings and, 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 and uh, statistics on mass shootings is they're over in three to five minutes. And my officers aren't gonna get there. Now, if I have an SRO that's there, they have a chance at saving lives. Um, I think it's a really good program. I think that there's certainly some groups that need to be listened to. Can we do anything better? Absolutely. Can we, uh, going back to my earlier conversation, can we have better positive interaction? Can we draw, can we draw up a program that's better? Sure. And we always need to look at that. But um, I will tell you, getting rid of the SROs makes our job tougher. Uh, we have an obligation through Maryland state law that we have to provide adequate coverage and not being able to, you know, not being able to have those SROs in that school. I don't know if that, you know, to me, uh, to me, I, I, I want those officers there for that adequate coverage, like being in the school rather than, you know, driving through the parking lot and uh, just kind of being out on a corner watching things. I want them having those positive interactions uh, with our students. Um, I could go on and on in SROs. I know we're creeping up on our time, but I think it's a valuable program. Chief Jones thinks it's a valuable program. We should maintain it. I don't, I don't disagree at all that we need more counselors, that we need more he mental health professionals, and we need to find a way to do that. And, and, and I guess that's part of the thing. Let's find a way to do both because both of them have incredible value. Uh, so let, let's, let's figure out where, where we can uh, get the resources to do both. Um, so uh, one, that's last, my... one last question before we conclude for the evening, somebody asked uh, via Facebook again about uh, COVID-19 vaccinations for your staff. Uh -huh. are, have you already, are your guys already vaccinated and what's their requirement for wearing masks on duty? Uh, so the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the majority of my officers have been vaccinated. There are uh, there are some officers that have chosen not to get a vaccine. There are other officers that have medical uh, that are seeking medical guidance from their doctors about whether they should get. Um, uh, vaccinated because they may have an underlying condition. So there's no requirement that they're vaccinated, but the, the, uh, a good majority of them 
have been vaccinated. I, I've been lucky enough to get vaccinated as a as a uh, 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 as a uh, law enforcement officer. The uh, uh, wearing masks when they're in public, they, they're subject to the to the same uh, requirements by the by the county health officer and by the state of Maryland. Um, I will tell you, so you know when they can't social distance outside, they should be wearing a mask and interacting with people when they're inside. They should be wearing a mask. So I'll be honest with you though, uh, it's tough. Uh, from the perspective of what you're dealing with, uh, here's an example. Uh, I stopped on Ellsworth yesterday because I had a bunch of, about a dozen skateboarders being uh, disorderly. And they're carrying on. And I jumped out of my car to do my job and, and, and you know, get them off private property and get them moved on so that they're not causing a disturbance to the other folks there. And about three minutes into the interaction, I realized, oh crap, I didn't put my mask on. Um, and, 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 you know, we have so many things we're looking at that sometimes, uh, sometimes we, we make a mistake. So I'll be honest, we get complaints into my office, you know, this officer wasn't wearing a mask. And we look at each one of them and, you know, we, we counsel our folks, let's do a better job, we can do better. But there are instances, uh, you know, I reviewed a video yesterday of a, of a shoplifter that got stopped, or actually last week, a shoplifter, that, uh, a professional shoplifter that gets stopped down local, and she resisted arrest. And the officers in dealing with, I mean, this immediately went to, we get a call for service, we get a lookout, oh, we see them, and we jump out of our car to go do our job. And they forgot to put a mask on. Uh, because believe it or not, it takes some extra thought to do that, especially when your adrenaline's rolling, because you're like, oh, I got to look out and there they are. I got to go get them. So you, you, you make mistakes like that and we do our best to deal with them, but they should be following the guidelines put forward by the state and the county health officer. And, and we do our best to do that. And we remind our officers often to, to uh, do that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Commander Frank, for being with us uh, this yeah. evening. I hope it was useful from your point of view. I know that uh, we uh, learned a lot from your presentation and look forward to getting together with you in May of this year for our next quarterly meeting with the third district. So thank you very much. And uh, thank everybody who was able to uh, join us for this quarterly meeting of a Safe Silver Springs Community Conversation with MCPD. And uh, stay in touch, um, contact us via Facebook or by our website. So thank you everybody. Um, that's it for this evening. Thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you, everyone. Good night. Here. Good night. Good thank night. you, Commander. Take care, guys. Good night. Thank you, great meeting. Thank you.